I remember my first plateau. I was 14, I'd been training for a couple of years already, and I was actually getting kind of strong. I had already eclipsed a 200 pound bench and a 300 pound squat, and I thought it was just nothing but blue skies ahead. See, I was so eager to get ahead and set myself apart from the other better athletes that were on the football team that I was taking advice from anybody who would give it. I talked to all the jack kids on my football team, I talked to all the old buff dudes at the 24 hour fitness I trained at, and I talked to every coach and trainer I could get the time of day from. So they had all given me largely the same type of advice. It all had to do with the workout. It was go as hard as you can, leave it all on the floor, push the limit. And when you come in next time, go harder. When you think you've given everything you can, give a little bit more. Now that worked immensely well. I had gotten into the habit of going into the gym with the intention of absolutely murdering myself. And the results spoke for themselves. It worked right up until it didn't. See, around that time, I had a goal set. I was desperate to hit my first 315 squat. Not only was I fixated on getting each extra wheel on the bar at that time, but 315 was enough to set me apart from the other kids on the team. So I was desperate. I was about 10 or 15 pounds away, and I had come across a visualization technique. See, this was kind of in the era where the secret was popular, and visualization was kind of a thing. And basically it led me to believe that all I had to do was close my eyes really tight, imagine everything that I wanted in the world. And when I opened my eyes, it would be there. It would manifest in front of me. So the night before my big workout where I was adamant that I was gonna hit that number, I ran through the sets. I ran through walking the bar out, taking that breath, burying it and standing up. And I had all of the confidence going into that workout the next day that no 14 year old deserves to have in anything. So sure enough, I show up to the gym, I unrack the bar. I know that I'm just gonna murder it. And as I descend, I hit that last little bit of depth where you know if it's going up or not. And I thought, oh shit, that bar folded me in half. Now I got so frustrated at that point that I just stopped doing leg day. Every workout was just an opportunity to try 315. And you can imagine how well that went. So another summer came where I had all the way until fall to do nothing but lift, sleep and eat. And I thought, this is it. This is where I'm going to get over that hump. So if working really hard work before, I just need more of that. I just got to go harder, bro. I just got to push it to the limit. Well, summer came and went and I had absolutely zero pounds on my squat and just a pair of really achy knees. So around that time, I thought, what the hell am I doing? If this is what training is, and this is what I can expect to get out of it, what's even the point? Well, in the early era of the internet, early 2000s, how the hell do you get stronger after you've plateaued for so long? I was fortunate enough to actually get a response from the search engine that had something to do with my search query. Now, the thing I came across was a linear progression. At the time, I saw this as being some long forgotten tool of the strong people from years past, because this is what people use in the 50s and 60s, and even on into later decades to reliably and predictably get strong. It just wasn't necessarily popping up in all the bodybuilding magazines I was reading. So I looked at the protocol, which was basically start with a few easy sets of five and add a little tiny bit of weight every single time you come into the gym. I looked at it and I thought, how could this be it? This doesn't make any sense. All of this very easy, embarrassingly light work, it's sub-maximal, it's sub-optimal. How is this going to get me to the point where when I put 315 back on the bar, it's gonna go? Well, I was frustrated. I had no other options. I had tried the old way that had worked before, but since stopped working. So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna stick to this thing. So I started day one, I had 185 on the bar, which guys on the football team were benching for reps. This was my squat workout. And I did not break stride, I stuck with it, adding a little bit of weight every single time, getting in two or three times a week into the gym. And it didn't take longer than five or six weeks before I was starting to approach that PR territory. Well, not only did it work, but I steamrolled past 315. The first time I hit 275, I'd beat my previous PR because I did it for a set of five across. So to hit a one rep max, but then do it for a set of five across multiple sets was absolutely huge. And then I started to do the math, like, God, I'm gonna be squatting 900 pounds in no time. Now, what that did was brought to my attention a very interesting relationship that hadn't been laid out to me before. And that is the relationship between what you do today in the workout, in the moment to get stronger, so that when I come back next time, I can maybe lift a little bit more weight, and what you do long-term, how you string those workouts together. So the relationship between those two dimensions of training is very important because they're both important to just about any type of training you do, but you can't hit the gas on both of them. 
If you want to be able to go as hard as possible today, you're not leaving yourself any room to go hard next time you come in. And if you want to be able to have a sustainable progression where you can predict how the weight jumps are going to go, you're not going to be able to hit the gas. So they're connected and it's very important to understand that relationship. So when thinking about these trade-offs, I think of it like studying for a test. So in thinking about all the time I spent in school, all the years I spent wasted dropping classes because I would get halfway through and just stop showing up to class, so that same relationship between intensity and effort and sustainability, it really holds up in that example. If you want sustainability in school and if you actually want to get an understanding of the stuff you're doing, you're going to do a little bit of paying attention during class, a little bit of paying attention when you do homework, and you're going to spend a little bit of time going over this stuff in your free time until your brain kind of takes it and makes sense of it. That is in direct opposition to spending 12 hours the day before an exam chugging cappuccinos and trying to force this information into your brain regardless of whether or not it wants it. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the nature of sustainability and workouts and how these two different approaches to training can both be used effectively and how they balance each other out because they definitely do have trade-offs. And guys, I'm super proud to have Boost Camp as a primary sponsor of this channel. Not only is Boost Camp the easiest and most intuitive way to track your training and your progress, not only is it absolutely free to use, not only does it feature an immense library of some of your favorite programs, but it features an exclusive library of programs you will not find anywhere else. In fact, there's so much content there. I'm actually doing a series specifically dedicated to the programs that you will only find on Boost Camp. Stop what you're doing right now, click the link below, download Boost Camp. And guys, as I film this, this channel just hit 100,000 subs like five minutes ago, and that number would not have been possible without the support of sponsors like Boost Camp. So I wanna thank you, the viewer, for your support, and I wanna thank Boost Camp for their support. So one of the big obstacles that people run into when they start to hit a wall in their training is they don't stop to consider which dimension they're paying the most amount of attention to because these trade-offs that exist are gonna be more or less appropriate depending on how advanced you are and what your goals are. So if we look at this guy over here, starting out all stick and bones, who ideally gets to this journey where they're kind of buff, you know, guys doing a little bit of a side chest pose on his way to the bodybuilding stage. It's easy to think about this as being a straight line, like one direction, and it's not. It's a series of lines that take you from point A to point B, and each one has its own stops and pitfalls along the way. As you start out very early on in that kind of beginner novice territory, more things work, there's more right answers, and it's not until you really start to get some development and advancement that you have to be a bit more careful about the way in which you get forward. It's not until you start to get some momentum and get some improvements that you really have to consider exactly how you're moving forward because it's going to be very different as time goes on. The same thing's not always gonna work. So more intermediates have to have kind of a medium specificity where you didn't need to really be specific at all when you were starting out. When you're starting out, everything works. Then as you get strong, you get more advanced, now you need a lot more specificity. In fact, you're not going to be competitive whatsoever if you don't have it. So that funnel of specificity is huge in trying to consider what type of training you're going to do. So when you consider what type of program you're doing, they come in all different flavors. Are you doing a very specific program where you're only doing the competitive lift or close variations of it? Or are you throwing in a bunch of isolation work, a bunch of uh, varied accessory work? Are you doing something that's periodized, that's very rigidly periodized, like a uh, linear periodization scheme, where you're doing something that's more kind of on the fly uh, by the seam of your pants? Is there a lot of frequency or a little frequency? Are you using a method of progression? If so, what kind? Because there's a lot of them. On top of all of this, you have to consider if your arrangement of training considers the now or the later. So as we talked about, the now has a lot more to do with how do I grow today? It's more about organizing your training within the workout to get a desirable effect. So if you go really hard, if you exhaust yourself, if you use a ton of effort and just leave it all there, you're going to pretty reliably get a positive training effect, at least in the beginning. So high effort and a ton of work, that's all oriented around the type of training you're doing now. Now that works really well for the novice because there doesn't have to be direction. Blunt force is a hell of a tool. That's gotten a lot of people from point A pretty close to point B. But as you start to run into walls and you need more specific solutions, you'll find that just relying on effort isn't always going to fly. 
consider trying to get your squat and deadlift ready for a meet. If you're a power lifter, you're going to find that going really, really hard on both of those in close proximity to each other doesn't really work. So then you have to take steps to spread them apart, maybe alternate lighter days with heavier days. Maybe your squat, you can go heavy every week, but your deadlift has to go every other week. All of these considerations are going to take you more into later territory. How do you structure the week, more importantly, the month, so that all of this stuff is sustainable? Because <clears throat> this is going to be all about sustainability ability. So later has to do more with how do I progress over time? How do I make it so that my efforts in the workout are going to be sustainable and that I can predictably hit the big lifts when I need to. So strategy, that's a big thing here. It has to be sustainable, predictable, and it doesn't involve killing yourself. So focusing more on that is going to involve more maneuvers that have less to do with just going in and just destroying yourself. So why do we talk so much about this? It's not just because it is an effective way to train or that so many people do it. It's because it's actually preferable in some circumstances. If you are only hypertrophy driven, if you're a bodybuilder, you really only need to think about the now. You set your exercises that you think will help you grow. You set the training threshold, the sets and reps you think will help you grow, and you just go hard. You find ways to progress when you're able but the big thing is just pairing the amount of effort you're doing with the right, the optimal, quote unquote, amount of work in the week and in the workout that's going to allow you to hit those goals. Because with bodybuilding, we don't have to worry about hitting those big lifts predictably. With bodybuilding, we don't have to worry about CNS fatigue. It doesn't really exist above five reps. So you can go in and go hard and not really worry about backsliding. Because even if you come in weak, it's not necessarily about being strong. It's about getting enough fatigue, enough stimuli that's going to help you get a little bit better next time and help you accrue some mass over time. Now there are other programs, other ways of training that mimic that. Conjugate is a pretty good example. And I would put in like bro power lifters and strongmen. I know a lot of people that train this way where they worry more about just getting as much work in as they can right now, hitting that heaviest weight they can right now. And then they'll throw things in on the back end to make it sustainable. So conjugate, you're going max all the time. You're hitting the gas all the time. You're just rotating the exercises so it's sustainable. There isn't really dedicated waves, at least not on the main lifts. They might do some waves on the speed work. They might do some waves on the other stuff, but that's very short term. For the main lift, you're hitting the effing gas. And for uh, the bro guys, and there's a lot of strength guys that do this. These are the sick deadlifters, you know, and every time they're posting on IG, they're hitting this absolutely balls out deadlift. There's a lot of strong men that do the exact same thing because they have to juggle so many things. So they only really have the ability to focus on effort in the workout as they juggle through all these events that they're trying to do. You have less ability to really carve out a very tightly put together uh, periodized program that's very structured but mainly just because of the predict unpredictability. The thing about that type of training, focusing on the now, you just have to know your rep and volume range, go as hard as you can. The important thing for making that sustainable, you hypertrophy guys, you bodybuilders, really just know how and when to either reset, deload, or change. I wrote about this in base strength. This is stress, recovery, and novelty. I just refer to it as SRN. At any given time, when you hit a wall, those are the three things you can focus on that will help you get through to the next level. Uh, resetting the weight, that reduces the stress. Deloading allows recovery and change, changing to a different exercise, different threshold, that's novelty, which in and of itself is a form of recovery. Now, any program you look at that has to do with building strength long-term, or if you do have the ability to find something because going hard isn't working for you, you need a method of progression. When you start focusing on the later, the longer programs, whether you're putting together mesocycles or blocks, or whether you're trying to find some, a double progression, a step progression, any type of you know, old school, very simple type of progression, any, any of those schemes is gonna fit. It's gonna be a part of this. Periodization is gonna have elements of that baked in because you're changing over time. It's deliberate. You're setting up uh, what you do in the beginning to go into the next thing. So that involves starting back, right? You have to start a bit lighter. It's not as intuitive. You might be looking at the percentages thinking, what the hell is that? That's not work. That's not gonna do anything. It's not about the day. It's about how all the work within the month fits to cause this net effect. So you're going up a level. You gotta pay attention a little bit more. Uh, powerlifting and Olympic lifting, the most specific people you see, but powerlifting, the more kind of uh, high achieving specific powerlifters are gonna follow something like that too. And it's gonna be a lot more about the actual arrangement of work than it is just about going hard. It's not just 
what threshold you're in it's when you're in that threshold so you can predict what the next phase is going to be like and how that phase is going to take you into your meat because timing is very important here there has to be a deliberate start doesn't matter if you're doing periodization doesn't matter if you're starting a very simple linear uh progression there has to be a deliberate start and it's usually something sustainable so if you're detrained if you're coming back from a layoff it's something that you can do right now recovery should be baked in either the deload should be baked in the changes in phases should be baked in there's something in there that makes it sustainable so it kind of takes a guesswork out and it's just wash rinse repeat you just have to follow the plan it really is that simple so these are the two flavors of programming that are going to ultimately dictate what your decision making is and should be and who it's broadly appropriate for this is going to apply to most of you so any questions you have guys leave it in the comments better yet take it to patreon that's where i upload my training weekly i answer questions i have a weekly thread every week where i do everything from form reviews to giving life advice so that's the easiest way to get in contact with me thanks so much for watching guys until next time this is bromley i'll see you